Okay, everyone, with us in this session, uh, C++ Compiler, Libraries and Tools, we've got John Thomas, who, Director of uh, Product Management, Product Marketing for Developer Tools and Interface. Hello, everyone. We've got Lee Canty in the C++ R&D team. Hello. And we've got Don Perchik. Hello. And then on the line from Montana, we've got Roger Lawrence. Looked like he muted. And from Eli, are you in, where are you, Massachusetts, New York? Where are you? Eli, you're online. Manchester, Massachusetts. That's what I thought. Manchester, Massachusetts. Not Manchester, England. Manchester, United. That would be different. Okay. And then Roger's with us from uh, somewhere in the frozen wasteland of Montana. And he looks like he's muted for a moment. Okay. So uh, I'll let JT kind of host and, and uh, I'll, I'll click the slides. And I'll mute uh, the microphone, and uh, we'll we'll maybe go from there because that'll make my life a little easier just at the moment. Certainly. Well, I'll start by um, saying this is a pretty informal uh, session. Um, pretty much any question is open, even personal, oh, although you my. may not like the answer. Um, you know, we're, this is the uh, core of the C++ uh, development team: uh, compilers, libraries, linkers, debuggers. Um, pretty much everything that you use to build applications uh, that compile your C++. So this is your opportunity to um, ask them anything you'd like or ask me anything you'd like. Uh, I, I can certainly talk about uh, motivations behind some of our features or decisions and or roadmap items that we've publicly disclosed up until this point. Um, and then, of course, we have experts in each uh, area that are with you today as well. So we'll go through some slides also to help keep the conversation going, but um, but this is your opportunity to insert questions, and David will be keeping a close eye on those so that we can make sure that we can get your questions answered. Okay. And I might put on the this guy here just so I can hear. Nope, it's not going to work. Uh, it will if you plug in. <clears throat> this little dongly thing mm -hmm. into your machine. Okay. But then nobody else will hear. Hold on. Right. I, well, I, there I, is I, definitely a delay, so. Um, I had a problem earlier. Let me try. This is now your opportunity while we're figuring this out, the technical difficulties to post your questions. Let's see if this works. And David, if you wouldn't mind putting me into organizer mode too, then I can okay. help answer those as we go along. So we're going to start by uh, just making sure everybody's aware of all the different compilers that we're building. A, As I'm sure you're all aware, uh, the compilers that, are, that you're using are actually executables that run on Windows. So uh, you're building 32-bit, uh, 64-bit ARM uh, OS X uh, executables on Windows, and this is a term known as cross-compiling. It, the compiler itself runs on Windows, and the output, of course, needs the proper target in order to run on it. So this is just the, the, the creation of the executable itself. And for ARM, uh, Android, for example, uh, we build an SO. We don't actually build a, an executable. And that's largely because of the way that Android is, uh, supports native uh, executables through the NDK. It's not a... Uh, an executable in the traditional form where startup code knows how to call into it, but rather Dalvik has a little, there's a little Dalvik call that then calls into the main entry point of your SO. But at that point, it pretty much takes over. So the uh, compilers that we uh, deliver today include 32-bit uh, compiler for Windows, a OS X uh, compiler. Those share the same front end, and they both compile 32-bit executables. On the uh, Clang side, uh, which is the C++11 uh, compilers, we delivered the 64-bit uh, Windows compiler uh, last year. And over th throughout the year, we've delivered the ARM compilers for iOS and the ARM compiler for Android as well. Um, one thing I, you might want to be, or you may be interested in knowing, is uh, we do have an, another product called App Method, if you haven't heard of it. And in there, we actually uh, make the Android C++ compiler 
a free to use compiler uh, for iPhone apps. Or, I'm sorry, <laughs> iPhone apps for phone apps uh, that can go into the Android App Store. So if you want to play with Android, this is definitely a great way to get into it and uh, use that compiler and use the C++ 11 front end. Of course, uh, if you buy the product, then you get access to um, all the platforms, the Rad Studio or C++ Builder products. So that's kind of a, a high-level overview of, uh, of the tool chains. Uh, well, the compilers, the tool chain, of course, is much broader than that, including various linkers and various... Uh, ancillary tools that are needed to do pre-processing and the front-end compilation and the back-end uh, code generation and the linking um, and bring it all together uh, to result in an executable that will run on the device. And JT, the first two questions um, are the same and you also covered this uh, on Tuesday for some people who were in your sessions. What about uh, full C++11 on Win32? What about it? No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> yeah, I shared in my uh, C++11 uh, talk, I was showing a bunch of C++11 features, and I demonstrated an example, uh, which I built with the 64-bit compiler, and then I turned around and built it with Win32. So yes, we are actively working on this compiler. Um, we don't have an announced release date, but what I would like to recommend is if you want access to this compiler when we're ready to run a beta, you need to be on a recent version or the most recent version. So look into uh, the recharge program that we have available. If you're on XE7 today or XE6, you want to recharge into XE7. It's a low-cost way to stay current. It's a subscription uh, plan in the sense that uh, you need to stay with each additional <clears throat> version when it comes out in order to enjoy uh, that, uh, that discount. Additionally, if you're on maintenance, then you're automatically uh, in the latest version and you're automatically, if you're interested, you can be added to the beta when it's available. So, um, yeah, pretty exciting and uh, works great. I'm the, one of the few who uh, run it on the integration build on my machine. Uh, so um, I know a lot of people are already sending me private emails going, when can I get it? Um, so, like I say, be on the latest version of the product and when the beta starts, we'll make sure that you're aware and uh, you'll be able to uh, to get it. Okay. No, it was, it's a library question. We'll get to it at the end. Sure, no problem. Okay. There is a question I see here about uh, fully C++11 compliant. Um, there are features in the uh, C++11 tool chains we don't support yet that are part of C++11. So there's two things that are happening to get there. One is uh, moving to at least Clang 3.3. That's where the full uh, C++11 compliance came in. Part of the reason we haven't moved there yet is because uh, we want to have a stable tool chain out there and we need to get to multiple platforms and make sure that you have a common source code base across them. With that said, um, this is something that's actively being uh, developed as well. Additionally, there's some library uh, features that need to be supported, uh, like features. and. Uh, that is something that actually I have a header file for that I can use. Um, so this is absolutely the goal of these compilers uh, to get to that full compliance. Um, and you can also see how compliant we are. We do have a, a page on the uh, doc wiki that will show you which features are supported or not supported uh, in C++11 today. So that's the long answer um, and let you know uh, we're working on it. Anything to add, uh, Lee or anybody? I would. Uh, I do want to mention that the the Dinkumware uh, STL that we use, as well as the uh, platform STLs that we use on iOS and Android, um, actually have good support uh, for the standard. So um, that so, should should not be an issue. Go ahead, so David. JT and Lee, we might as well handle this now. It it, it sort of tied into the C plus plus eleven. JT, you you talked about uh, the version of Clang that that we're moving towards from the one that we shipped today with 3.1 and some of that affects the and some, of, and some of that affects what we can and cannot use in standard libraries and in our test suites right so so you you talked about dinkumware we also have boost correct uh, maybe lee you want to mention now or just do a little bit of talking about 
the the fact that because of the version of Clang we're using, because of our different compilers on Win32, OS X, and then for the devices, uh, we have different levels of C++11 support. And, and Ludo's question was, he uses the word, but it's not in caps or in quotes, uh, full C++11, but then also how it relates to whether or not we would have full boost or end or full dinkumware uh, support as it relates to all sorts of things. And I know it's a complicated topic, but uh, maybe a few words from you about what we do today and in yeah. general and, and, and where we're going. Sure. It, you know, the word full is, is, is tough because really there's, there's very few people you're going to find anywhere that have full support uh, looking at the different support I see, uh, for Android or for iOS, um, they're all lacking in in some specific way. Um, we uh, definitely are targeting to be the most compliant we can on every platform. Uh, we're still catching up. Uh, obviously, Win32 is 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 our next big push. But as we uh, move along for each platform in each version of our product, we're, we try to polish it up and make sure that we are supporting whatever that library supporting. So we're only using, we, we're complicated by the fact that we're using different versions of different compilers and though we're starting to standardize on Clang, though we're behind the current stand, the, the current level. But also we have different STLs that we're using on every platform almost. Um, we, between Dinkumware, libstandard C++ for Android, uh, uh, libc++ for iOS, we're trying to get all those combinations working, you know, as fully as we possibly can. I'd like to add actually a question to the attendees because this is something that we've been uh, discussing and your feedback would be uh, well received. Part of the reason, and this may seem obvious, that we use uh, the platform STL on iOS and Android is so that, um, one, you don't have to deploy an additional library, and two, uh, so when you're using other libraries that use that same STL, um, that you have compatibility. And so the question I want to pose is, what's more important, uh, having not 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 having the requirement to deploy this additional library? Like let's say, for example, we were to bring Dinkumware to iOS and Android. The trade-off would be a larger executable, but the pro would be that you'd have the same level of support across all these platforms. So just a question to throw out there. Certainly feel free to respond through the questions uh, pane. Um, something I'll add in a future survey as well. For now, we, w we decided to go with the approach where we use the platform STL because we did not want to impose a requirement that you uh, have to package uh, Dinkumware into your executable, statically link everything uh, to uh, take that to those platforms. OK. Um I took this slide, this sort of ties back into tool chains and platforms and libraries and compilers. Uh, I took this from our doc wiki and then got updates from members of the team as well. And it, it's by no means uh, complete or accurate, I'm sure. Um, and But it's meant to just show some of the pieces and parts of target platforms, libraries, compilers, tools. Uh, input files, output files, some of which you've already talked about. Um, if there's mistakes, we'll get it to the doc team and they'll update the, the charts and there's library managers and linkers and, and all sorts of different linkers. I don't know if you, if some of you, including either Roger or Eli or members in the room want to <laughs> talk about this or we just go to the next slide maybe. I don't know. Well, Your it, choice. I, real quick, David, I think it does uh, express a, this complex um, even though C++ is a language that can be well supported on all these platforms, you know, this team is busy thinking about how do we deliver that solution. And it, it does require a lot of different uh, tools, a lot of different f object formats. Um, if you attended Eli's exception handling uh, talk this morning, there's a lot of differences in, in exception handling on every single platform, even between Win32 and Win64. So I hope this helps you appreciate the challenge and the amount of uh, effort that this team goes through to give you a common C++ experience across all these platforms. One thing that's not mentioned in here um, is that there are tools, of course, to do dump binary dumps and 
look at symbols and those kinds of things. So, um, you know, this is just really the tool chain part of it to generate the executable. But there are the other tools that you need, including uh, debuggers and those other things that know how to read all these binary formats and give you a common experience in the IDE. And again, right, it's not just the, the language and the standard library or even the platform specific library things that have to be done, like Windows APIs or, or frameworks for iOS and Android and so on. But then we have our own RTL that supports our frameworks, VCL on Windows 32 and 64 and FireMonkey across all the platforms. So um, now if you're just building console apps and you're just using a, a main and some C++ code that does a printf, uh, go, you know. You can do fun. that now. Other than I don't, I don't think you can build a console app for iOS, can you? Maybe you can. I know on Android you can. Yeah, you can build an iOS console app. We use it for debugging purposes, but we don't expose it as an okay. option to do. Yeah, but, but someone can compile and link and create something, copy it, and go. Right? I mean, yeah. But again, you guys use again the how, maybe that's a conversation about how a team does certain things. I know that you you have tools that you use to build and test as you're building up the compilers and linkers and tools and everything else as we move to new platforms, right? And then cert versus uh, what our customers who are building applications. Uh, in a different way. They're not building frameworks necessarily or what we're doing, right? Right, yeah. Because well, when we start off, we, we really just have to bootstrap it from the very bottom. And, and so our testing tools have to you know, regard that. We, sometimes we don't, we don't expose those things out because they're not really usable for the, for the user in their day-to-day -day work. It's just for the bootstrapping effort we need to have a lower level set of tools. Okay, so uh, what I'll do is move on maybe to the next slide. Actually, there's a quick oh, question sorry. here, David. And it has to do with the debugger. So it asks if the runtime debugger is dependent on the compiler in use. For example, would we expect different debugging results when compiling BCC32 or BCC64 or Clang? So I'll answer at the top end, and then I'll pass over to Don. But yes, it is dependent because the debug format is going to be uh, – well, we try to use the same debug format. But I'll let Don get into some details. With the, with the re different results, I mean, that is possible, I imagine. But let me pass it over to Don. Well, we also, Don, we also get debug information. For example, on Windows, we get the Windows SDK, and we have, what, release and debug versions, I think. And I'm not sure. Maybe that's from the old school days. Yeah. And for OS X or iOS, for example, there's debug information that we can get access to, right? There's certainly debug information in there, but um, we don't ship all um, the C++ libraries aren't shipped with debug versions, however. Okay, so things like Dinkumware, Boost, and whatever, those are just release builds? Correct. I think Boost, we actually do on some Boost stuff, but not for Dinkumware. Yeah. Okay. And size, then on... Size, for size purposes, we may not even be doing that because it's a little bit... It's yeah. it's it's really bloats the size on, on Dinkumware. I mean, on Boost. And then on Android, we are using the native SDK, right? And there's libraries there that come from... As part of the uh, Android SDK? Correct. Correct. Yeah, okay. All right, so again, it comes under the heading of lots of pieces and parts and different uh, files. And again, this was just a, a quick attempt at some of that. And then we get to the, again, the libraries and components. So we talked a little about that. Uh, our, our own RTL to support VCL and FireMonkey. FireMonkey, VCL, the FMX is across all these platforms. Um, but I, you know, I, and again, as you mentioned, I think there's other pieces that we get on some of the other platforms that ended up getting linked in or used in your application, right? Yeah, I mean, one thing I, I don't see here, when you say RTL, I'm assuming you mean C, RTL, or STL, but also, of course, the uh, Object Pascal or Delphi RTL is part of what drives VCL and FMX, so you certainly have access to that as well. You can use some primitives from that RTL just as well as you can use primitives from, from C++. So you have... a as a C++ builder or app method developer, you have a pretty broad range of primitives and low-level RTL functions that you can use. Some easier to use in C++, some a little more challenging when you're interacting with uh, Object Pascal. Bruno did a talk yesterday where he covered a lot of these, um, you know, ways to to approach when you're going to be using um, Object Pascal, uh, RTL or VCL type of stuff. But um, 
But so that's actually a big library that people have access to in, in these products. And sorry, what was your question, David? I, I'm conf I don't have a question. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, I think it was more, well, maybe, again, as Lee already said, we're getting pieces and parts and libraries and other things from on different platforms from different providers, oh, not sure, just yeah. our own, not just our own code and our own system RTLs and, and thing. And That's the, a good point. I mean, we could share a, a quick example with you one that I ran into personally, which was default initialization. If for STL uh, containers, default initialization is actually implemented inside of a header file in the STL. And so when we initially started supporting iOS, we were using the platform STL that was delivered on the platform. Well, we needed to instead use the one that's delivered in Xcode and updated in order to get access to those features. So that was an example where picking the right libc++ um, could affect uh, some of the C++11 features that are available to you. Now that's fixed and you have access to that now. There is, there is a question. There is a question here as it relates to VCL and FireMonkey. It's sort of a two-part question from Mike. One is, uh, is there an advantage of using VCL on Windows over FMX? That's part one of the question. The second part is, do we plan to port FMX to other platforms? Okay, I guess I'll take that one. Um, it depends. Uh, if you're just doing, if you're doing just Windows development, um, actually VCL or FMX have different uh, positives. VCL, I think the biggest positive for using VCL is that um, the control set is more uh, Windows-y. Um, one misnomer that most people probably uh, have a, a misunderstanding uh, about is that actually out of the hundreds of graphical controls we provide in the VCL, only about 30 of those are provided as standard controls in Windows as with the standard standard controls. The rest of these are owner draw controls that were built uh, by Borland and, and are part of the VCL. So that um, the reason why I mention that is because FMX uses an owner draw mechanism as well. Um, these are just bitmaps at the end of the day. You can make them look exactly like the control that's rendered by the platform. So that's largely how we do uh, FMX controls on Windows. Uh, the other advantage of using FMX on Windows is that the styling engine is a little more full feature. There is a styling engine for VCL as well, uh, but the FMX styling engine uh, is it has broader support. You can do a lot more custom uh, type of work uh, with that. And I say that probably the third advantage uh, of FMX over VCL is that the rendering itself is done in the GPU. And what you get from that is access to hardware acceleration features such as shaders. So you can use shaders to add really cool effects, for example, to your controls. Uh, you can add a glow effect when somebody hovers over your button and it's a no cost um, it's a no cost feature because uh, you're using the GPU shader uh, to actually render that. So the other advantage I would say of FMX is if you are planning on doing multi-device, then you're going to have the same APIs across all the platforms. VCL does have some differences. Uh, when I'm talking about graphical controls, um, non-graphical frameworks and libraries are pretty much identical across all the platforms. But on the graphical side, FMX does have some differences. So if you want to manage a common source code base, then FMX is the way to go. Um, you also can use uh, tools that we provide as part of the bonus pack, like the Media Converter, to help take some VCL uh, changes uh, or differences into FMX. So that is an option for you as well. So again, I say it depends on really what you're trying to do. If you want something to be strictly a Windows program that you know has a, a real Windows uh, experience uh, in the sense that uh, it uses those controls that were provided by either Microsoft or by Borland, then VCL is probably a better choice. If you're even thinking about going cross-platform, and particularly with the Fire UI uh, feature we've recently delivered, then FMX, I would say, especially for new projects, is, uh, is how you want to go. If you want 
I should also say, if you want more parenting control, FMX, you can take any of the controls, any of the objects in FMX, most of them, and parent them to others. So you can parent a form to a form. You can parent a form to a, to a tab item. You can parent a form to a, a button. You can parent a form to a list box item. Uh, in VCL, there's some things you can do. We have frames and, and, and form inheritance and so on, and there's ways with window handle manipulations at the lower levels to do some things like put a form, for example, into a tab notebook or whatever, but you're doing a lot more work. Whereas in FireMonkey, it's just, you know, comparing anything to everything. If it's a, if it inherits from, what is it, FMX object, object yep. FMX object at the lower level versus T object. Uh, the other part of that question, and I already answered it, and something's going on with my question log. I don't know what it is. So once it's answered, I can't get back to it. Is uh, FMX for other platforms? The person didn't specify specifically uh, beyond the ones, the four that we support today. Uh, well, certainly, if a platform out there has enough demand, uh, market demand, customer demand, then yes, we will uh, look to bringing uh, FMX to that platform. I'll give you one example. We've already shared that we intend to uh, support Linux applications. Now, when I say that, um, to be very specific, we're going to support server-side applications. So when we say FMX, FMX can relate to the whole library, the cross-platform library, or it can relate to just the graphical elements. The graphical side of FMX is not going to be supported on Linux because Linux desktop is just not popular enough or there's not enough demand for us to spend the effort uh, to support it. Linux server, on the other hand, is very popular and has a lot of demand. So that's something that uh, that we're working on. Um, and we'll keep a close eye on the platforms out there. But right now, iOS, Android, Windows, uh, and Mac are the key platforms we're being asked to support. And those are the ones we're going to be focusing on. Um, and additionally, of course, um, we, uh, on the mobile platforms, for example, which are 32-bit today, we need to get to 64-bit. So that's a, another, uh, another platform that we're going to need to support. Um, so that's uh, an obvious one that we'll be working on. Uh, the one I would suggest there is that we do run annual surveys, and this is the best time for you to vote on the platforms that you care about or that you need us to support. So definitely participate in the survey when it comes out. Uh, we'll probably run it about April or May this year. Okay, there's a... Uh... Oh, this was a question that goes way back to C Builder 1. Um, really? In the sense of, uh, why didn't you rebuild the Object Pascal VCL Live as C++ VCL? That was a question that came up for those of you, like me, that were here before C when C Builder 1 came out. People asked, uh, why didn't you rewrite the VCL for C Builder? That's a, a good question. I'll, I'll share a quick anecdote. When I was, um, right about the time VCL was being developed and and uh, Delphi, before Delphi was released, it was a, a project that was pretty well um, hidden inside the organization. And I remember uh, I was walking down to the cafeteria through the Object Pascal support group, and I didn't hear much typing going on, which was out of the ordinary. So I picked my head into one of the cubes, and there was this guy using Visual Basic. So I started giving him a hard time. I'm like, why are you using Visual Basic? And he said, it's not Visual Basic showed me some object Pascal code and built a 32-bit Windows executable. And I was amazed by how quickly he was able to construct it. And I had been an uh, OWL user, of course, because that was the main C++ library we were using at the time. So it was a, an astounding uh, technology. Um, and it was really well designed and simpler in many ways when compared to OWL and issues like multiple inheritance and vtable layout and all these things that had caused uh, pain in extending and building out a C++ framework at the time in particular. So it just made sense to uh, conform the C++ compiler and extend C++ to be able to talk to Object Pascal and to work with Delphi and VCL. And uh, it, as you can see by using it every day, it works very well. Um, there are occasionally uh, some challenges in interacting with it, and Bruno covered much of those yesterday, but the benefit is huge. And so um, that is sort of the historical perspective on it. 
and it continues to be how we deliver software today. We still have an extremely large Object Pascal community, and so we're going to continue to build Object Pascal uh, tooling and frameworks and uh, make C++ work with it in the best way possible. Question here, does, any, does anybody else, Rob is asking, ask for Windows Phone support? <clears throat> yes, actually. Certainly I get requests for Windows Phone. Um, definitely not at the frequency that I hear um, about iOS and Android, and actually much less recently than I have, I have in the past. It's just not a platform most developers need to target. Um, it also was a little confusing when Microsoft did WinRT and uh, you know, in some ways, we're kind of waiting and seeing what they're going to be doing with WinRT. Um, but uh, yes, we do get requests. It just isn't at a level in which it justifies the investment into it at, the, at this moment. Uh, there's there's a question about DirectX 11 support in C Builder. The DirectX SDK. Can I use DirectX 11 uh, with C Builder XZ7? Sure. I mean, you need to import the DLL. Right. You're going to need to. You'll have to get the uh, SDK directly from Microsoft. That's a good. That's a good point. You do need to get the SDK from Microsoft today. Um, you do need to, just like you are used to doing when you're working with libraries that were built with Visual C++. You have to do your import libraries and uh, talk to the DLL. Uh, you can't statically link the lib file. Um, so, given those constraints, then yeah. Uh, but it's not something we get, we uh, have a license to bundle in, and and you know we we take the Windows SDK and we smooth out the edges, uh, we take out the things that are directly designed only for the Microsoft compiler, we convert the import libraries, and we do a lot of work to make it that all work nicely. Um, but we don't have a license for the DirectX SDK, and uh, we're not allowed to be doing that stuff at this point in time. Okay, there's a question here about. Are there plans to have wizards to create Windows ActiveX components or Windows services that allow FMX rather than VCL? Ah, um, and actually, Darren talked a little about this the other day because that question came up. Maybe it was from Gregor again that there's some exploration going on about Olay Control uh, mapping, but there isn't anything today for FMX. Correct. We're not really um, trying to build any platform-specific features into FMX um, that result in uh, code that, you would, that wouldn't be uh, portable. So that has not been our focus. With that said, um, things like uh, services are a little bit different. ActiveX is one thing, but being able to build a service, you know, that's, a, uh, I think, a valid um, target much like building a service on Android, for example. So um, we would focus more on the execution method as opposed to uh, trying to build a, a specific technology. So like we're not gonna do a Silverlight connector, for example, or, um, and in this case, we definitely do not have active plans uh, to do anything with ActiveX and FMX at this point. So, so let's move on to the standard libraries because I know that comes up uh, occasionally uh, as it relates to Dinkamware Boost and the things that we ship uh, currently in XE7 and then Lee I think or maybe it was Don was mentioning about how we on certain platforms like some of the mobile platforms we don't use Dinkamware we use whatever they have uh, that they're delivering on their platform so I, I just switched the slide yeah I think we already covered that um, for the most part but um, good to be aware of that definitely and again, in the case of Boost and Dinkamore for 32-bit Windows because the way the compiler is right now. But Lee, I, I know you spend time in the team and we were, we're running things like Plum Hall compliance tests and so on to show us the coverage that we have and, and, and these libraries like Dinkamware and Boost, they're very large and complex and, and there's things that have to be done even in putting harnesses or conditionals or whatever for all of these uh, big libraries as well, right? Sure. I mean, te trying to test all of them takes uh, a lot of time and effort for sure. And then JT, I know that, uh, was it SeaBuilder 4 it started or, and maybe SeaBuilder 6 when you were here uh, and, and then you came back? 
uh, we had a web interface, and you can actually go to the Wayback Machine, you know, the Internet Time Machine, and you can search for C++ Builder and uh, C++ uh, Test Suite results. And that we right. had a we had a web app where you could go and choose sections of the way back then C plus plus standard. Yep. Uh, and see what our results are by running the test. And we're running those tests all the time in R and D as well. Absolutely. Yeah. We used standard testing uh, frameworks. Um, right today, the way we describe our support is uh, sort of minimal, uh, frankly. Uh, so you can find it on DocWiki. Sort of the high level features are called out. The ideal thing to do, and, and we're, we've been discussing how to actually make it public, is to take these test results and to uh, share that. Now, it's going to be huge because <laughs> there's a lot of features that get tested, but um, that would be the most complete way to share exactly what's supported and what isn't because that's testing the compiler directly. So that format is sort of a, a big open question for us right now because it's a very large format and difficult to browse unless we build a, a, a reasonable uh, front end for it. And I know Ludo has asked me several times um, why we include certain header files. Uh, I think like future was one example, I think future.h or hp, I think future. But there's no implementation behind it. And should we have a, a some kind of pragma or warning message that tells people if they try to include one of these, maybe put something in the message window, but uh, maybe just a few words about that or not. I, I'm not putting, I'm not asking you to do more work, Lee. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, no, that's fine. Uh, really, I, I, those those situations fall into two classes, really. One is where the entire uh, feature is not supported, in which case we it's really a delivery error when that um, file ends up in the final delivered product. Uh, because it goes through multiple stages where we're committing it into the repositories. Then there's another database that gets driven to determine what gets put into each SKU, a different, different product. Uh, and so if it's, a, if it's a, a feature that's fully not supported and you see it in your header directory, that's a mistake uh, somewhere along the line. Then there's ones where a header covers multiple sub-features or, or uh, can be broken down into different levels of support. And so sometimes we will have a header which only partially supports the contents uh, for whatever reason. Uh, in, in one case, prior to the last version of the product, a bunch of the time stuff wasn't implemented in the version of Dinkum where we were shipping, but parts of them were. So the headers are out there, but parts of them were missing. Another example would be the, um, the distribution stuff. Right, distribution stuff. So. Uh, that that's really the way it breaks down, and so in one case it may be a mistake, in another case it's just we're not we're not there yet. And then uh, Ian put a comment in here, it's sort of a question. He says, "Look, we have these big partners like DevExpress and so on. Uh, they have they've supported the VCL for a long, long time. Uh, some of them are on FMX like TMS software and others." Um, and he's saying, "Do you offer support to third-party component builders?" For all of this, and and I was I'm typing a comment, but JT, you can you can add on. It's it's my group's job, and everybody's job here. We we brought in all of all of the major third party vendors that had VCL support more than a year and a half before we shipped Exe two, which was the first start of a subset of Fire Monkey, and we talked about and got their feedback about what we were doing and where we were going with multi device and encourage them to follow us and follow us along and to start building products and so on. But ultimately, what I tell our customers is you need to go talk to the partners that you get components from, whether it's VCL or you need FireMonkey components, you need to talk to them. You need to tell them that you need these capabilities. We don't own their businesses. We don't tell them, um, uh, what they have to do in their business. What we do is we give them information, we brief them uh, regularly, early, early on in every release that we do about the changes and multiple times during the test cycle, they all get all the early, 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 early betas and all the way through. So I'll turn it over to JT so I can finish this comment, but, but ultimately, if you don't talk to DevExpress, if you don't show these different VCL partners that you're doing work and you need their support for FireMonkey so you can move your applications forward, then even no matter what we tell them, 
they're going to be wondering, well, are you out there and will you pay versus ask it for it for free or some other uh, business style relationship? Yep. No, it's a good point, David. I mean, the early adopters from the third party community on FMX are doing really well. Um, and uh, TMS is one that comes to mind. He's doing, Bruno and his team are doing a lot of really, really cool components and work um, for multi platform. And many, many uh, other third party uh, component vendors have, have jumped on board and are, are delivering. Um, for example, Ray's, uh, uh, Ray Kanapka and his team have, uh, have started putting out some components as well. So, you know, sometimes it, it takes time for adoption, um, even within our community. Uh, as you, you know, have the demand uh, to go to mobile, which is more and more the case every day, this is when it becomes uh, critical. Um, and it, like David mentioned, the best way to ensure that the components you care about are available cross-platform is to tell that vendor. It, same goes for any tool that you use. You know, if there's a feature that you need from us, I have some ways of finding out. I either visit, uh, visit you or I see you when I'm traveling or... Um, I run a, a survey, but we don't always cover every question because there's just a lot to cover. So if there's something specific that you need, uh, certainly feel free to send me an email, um, jt.embarcadero.com, and I can uh, make sure that we look at adding that to a future survey or I do a more validation on how important that is. Um, and I would say, I, to follow on to Lee's previous um, answer, if there's library features also that are missing or you're finding in there that seem weird, QC, um, or I should say the quality portal um, this at this point, or email is a great way to make me aware of it at least, and then we can uh, fix it or make it better. So, um, yeah, I don't want to comment on Dev Express business, but some vendors decided this is a good business, and I think they're uh, appreciating that they got in early, and some decided that they want to be in, in other businesses. So, and, and Ludo is just, uh, and maybe this is for Lee, or I'm not sure, the relationship uh, Dinkinware does updates we we have an agreement or license with Dinkinware where we get things lead do we just pull things is there a periodic time how does that work sorry uh, no it's uh, we we don't we don't pull uh, too many incremental updates uh, we we decide we, we are ready to spend some time um, getting a new version ready and we uh, request a new version from Dinkinware uh, they send it to us and uh, there's um, some processing that we have to do currently, though uh, we're getting a little better because we don't we don't fit into some of their pre-built uh, libraries, uh, but they're working on um, still delivering something that's easier for us to consume because it takes a bit of time. Uh, but in general, when, when we decide we have the time to to spend to to make it better and and to test it all out. And how are they track? So they're tracking what's going on in ISO CPP. I know, Don. You go to the mess. You go to the meetings, and JT's been to meetings. Uh, Dinkinware is is on the committee, or are they tracking? So now, when we start talking about C plus plus fourteen and seventeen and twenty, uh, how do they keep going with the work that they're doing to stay up with C plus plus? Yes, they're they attend the committee and um, are. I, doing their best to keep up with the standard and, and changes that come along yeah so again uh, we're all part of this community we we started this with NCC way way back back then and tracked along the NCC standard we stopped um, you know when NCC stabilized and there was a C99 project that started I'm not sure if we get some C99 because of Clang or not I'm not sure if we get yeah we do yeah, okay, we do get some of it. Yep. Yeah. And we actually have those features listed in our um, our grid up on DocWiki. Okay. Just one real quick uh, point to make about the standard and libraries versus language. Um, it's, uh, it's actually more complicated than it may seem from the outside. I, I was given the example of default initialization. That's a language feature, it appears to most people, right? Because you describe it uh, syntactically in the language. You're not calling standard colon colon something. Yet, the actual implementation lives in the STL. So there's these kinds of uh, crossovers that may look like a language feature, but it's actually a library feature. And these are the things that these guys have to figure out when, even though they're part of the 
a committee that publishes the language in the library, going back and implementing it is, a, is another big challenge. So um, the PJ and his team, I think, do a, a great job of keeping up on that. And and Lee, maybe this is the the same discussion that you just had about Dinkamore that you, based on our release planning, you, you decide when to pull versus pulling all the time or incremental. Uh, what about boost libraries? Similar idea where you, you look at it when we're doing target release and then, because boost is releasing updates. I think we're on 1.55.0, for example, for 64-bit windows and one still 139 for 32-bit or our older compilers. Is it the same process for when we just, when we're grabbing boost? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty much the same process, though we, uh, we're, we we grab boost much more frequently than we used to um, because the, the compiler can uh, handle the language features better on the Win64 side. So as you, as you can see from your slide, the Win32 one we're not pushing forward because what happens is people use newer language features um, that aren't supported by BC32, and it's a lot of hassle to expect them all. A lot of them do, but not everybody um, has nice fallbacks for it. And so it's a, it's a lot more work to go through and pick and choose and prune and, and debug why things are going poorly. We're on the Win64 side. We are so close um, that it's, it's a pretty easy task in that regard. Can, and maybe this wasn't necessarily being asked, or maybe it is because my Q&A log is really, I don't know what's going on. Uh, can someone pull a later boost or an, an incremental updated boost and, and put, I know there's environment variables for where boost is that the ID and compilers uh, care about. We do have to make some changes, but they're they're fairly localized. Um, what you would want to do if you're if you wanted a, a fix or a change in boost, uh, I'd recommend you take it and then then um, compare the two and and make those same changes. You certainly will need to update the compiler configuration uh, to adjust for the version number of the compiler and things like that. And then there'll be a couple places here and there where we'll have we had to tweak things. From. A lot of the problems in the past have been the the conditionals inside of Boost test for you know if code gear C or uh, and that our compilers are very different beasts, and so those those old tests are no longer accurate, and you'll have to we have to adjust them. I don't think a lot of our changes so there's still changes that need to get pushed back into Boost to make it a lot easier. And that's actually a good point, though, that Lee just mentioned is it is an open source project. We're not the only ones that are able to contribute to that. You guys are developers. You can make changes. You can contribute those back to the open source project and help implement Boost with our compiler support just as well as we do. So if this is something that's particularly, you know, there's a per particular Boost class you just absolutely want to use, fix it. Look at our source code. See how we do it the kinds of uh, things we're looking for, if defs, for example, and uh, contribute it back. Uh, and I, I put this up. Uh, this is by no means <laughs> the exhaustive or even even near a small part of, uh, of the amount of tooling that's going on under the covers. Uh, preprocessors, linkers, dumpers, library tools. Um, uh, how many linkers are there? four, five, or six. I don't know. There's a bunch of linkers. Maybe there's, because uh, there's iLink3264, and then there's the linkers built in the IDE versus command line external tools. So there's lots of tools. You're missing a Make EXP. <laughs> That's an important one for 64-bit Windows. I, I'm going to just, <laughs> again. I would just want to make people aware of it. Go into the, the bin folder. Go into the bin folder. And you'll see a whole bunch of tools and go to the doc wiki and the help and you'll see tools as well. Let's, uh, uh, this was just a summary again, target compilers, target platform, what frameworks and libraries run across the different platforms. I'll make these slides available once I make some more fixes. Uh, I know we're running out of time. This one, I think some tips and, and tips and techniques for people if they're doing multi-device C++ development. Um, I put this one in. Um, the Win32 compiler and front end is pretty fast. So if you're really using Code Insight and you're in the ID and you're typing things, I, I usually select to start Win32 target platform. And then when I want to make sure that what I'm doing works in 
C++ 11 and the 64-bit iOS, whatever, then I'll switch over to the other target platforms to make sure I'm getting additional additional code insight, parameter insight help, and so on. That was one. Um, with FMX, we're trying our best to have one code base, but if you're doing certain platform specific, and we have samples like that where we'll say if def Android or if def yep. Mac OS or if def iOS and so on, so you'll see that in some of the samples. You can see that in some of the RTL and the library implementations for FireMonkey on specific platforms and, and so on. Um, SDKs, you can find the SDKs. Uh, I know we also set up SDK paths as part of installation and, and the SDK manager, which is under the options, uh, what is it, uh, tools, options, yeah. menu. And then there's an SDK manager where you can, we pre-build, for example, on install, if you choose to install Android, all the paths to all the different pieces and parts and tools. Um, and then you can add uh, iOS and OS 10 and use the PA server to go and have it fine for either iOS 7.x or 8.0 and OS 10, where all the files are over on the Macintosh side, uh, where uh, you've got Xcode installed and command line tools and libraries and so on. So again, that making sure that you have uh, the SDK manager. We also ship, and maybe that was more the uh, Deb or I don't know, if someone, but when um, we also include the Android SDK tools. We install those if you choose to install them, and you should be go. You should periodically go into your Android SDK manager, and go and see if there's new updated packages that you want. You should pull, versus what we gave you as part of the install. Sometimes there's updated USB driver. Uh, there's new versions mm -hmm. of Android uh, SDKs and and past samples documentation, whatever. So the SDK manager for Android which has a link from our project group on Windows. Yep. Uh, you can go in there and it'll tell you how many new packages there are and updated packages or whatever. So you want to, our ID doesn't do that for you automatically. You need to periodically go in and decide what you want to pull yep. uh, from, from the S Android uh, deliveries. Uh, and again, all of that, it, there's a whole doc wiki section on considerations for multi-device development. We're past time, but let me, uh, uh, oh, there was a question here from Mike about uh, the help files for Dinkumware libraries, and he, he used the term uh, that they're terse. I'm not sure whether we get delivered help files or what happens with the, the documentation for the Dinkumware libraries. Am I bringing up some, some bad things? Or? No, it's not bad. It's just I, I don't know what the doc team takes care of uh, okay. that side of it, so I'm not really... We have in the past ga gathered it from them, but I'm not really sure what the current status of that is. But Dinkamore has, they have help files when we grab Dinkamore. Oh, you're grabbing, you're grabbing the libraries that uh, that we grab. Okay. That's something we could look into. I mean, yeah. STL is STL in the highest, you know, you can get books and references pretty much anywhere on this stuff. Um, so you can rely on other sources uh, for the help. The parameters should be the same as what the generic uh, standard says. So um, unless there's something very specific you're looking for. But in any case, I'll, I'll take that action item to go take a look at that. Here's sort of a general question about size of executables, depending on which compilers and platforms you're using, if everything is equal in the sense of C++ and FireMonkey or C++ and, and standard libraries. Not sure. You're saying the 64-bit code seems to be larger than building a 32-bit Windows application. Ludo, I'm not sure, are you using VCL or FireMonkey there? Are you doing debug or release builds? Yeah. Or, I mean, uh, he's talking. Of he's, he's doing a VCL C++ project, uh, and both of them are debug. So more debug information is debug pulled in is big larger. time. Yeah, yeah, debug 20x larger maybe? <laughs> That's, That's just the, the multiplier. He, well, he put, and yeah. he put about 20x, <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. It, I think it needs to be that. Uh, it's, 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 oh, uh, go ahead, Roger. I was saying it could easily be between. Uh oh, I think I'm hearing feed. Oh. I, I, I think I'm hearing. I think I'm hearing feedback. Uh, Roger, I think I'm hearing feedback through your speaker. But go ahead. I'll mute on my end. Uh oh. 
Is that any better? Well, now you're muted, you can't say. Um, I was just saying that the 20X wouldn't surprise me because for, for the debug build on the 64-bit, there, there is no optimizer at all, and the IR is extremely low level. Yeah, so uh, I'm hitting all the wrong buttons. Okay, so yeah, uh, again, debug builds, a lot of debug information. Lots and and as Roger pointed out, that there, the optimizer doesn't run on the debug build, so it's going to yeah. be big. Yep. Okay. Well, everyone, uh, we're past time again, but it's it's great, and I'm not sure. I think that's all the the sort of guideline slides. So we've been doing the Q and A uh, all along, and I think I caught everything in the Q and A for what's going on in the Q and A log. So. I want to thank Roger and Eli. Eli, the exception handling session earlier this day was awesome. Bruno's session last night at 6 p.m. was awesome on uh, C++ with Object Pascal and, and cool and interesting things. He, he demoed, for those of you who don't know, and we're, he's giving me this source code, uh, he, had, he has some variadic templates in a header file where you can just include that in your project and you can use lambdas. Uh, in the same way you would use anonymous methods on the mm -hmm. Pascal side. Very, very cool and wonderful. And then said that that would be baked in so you didn't, wouldn't have to include this this helper header file that he's going to give us. But, for example, parallel for loops, where in, in Delphi they would use an anonymous method right in line so you could get access to everything versus having to have some external invoker right. of some kind. You just put the lambda, and you can put your code, and and it's awesome. You know, you're hiding the complexity, which is what Bjarne talked about yesterday in, in about making code simple readable. things yeah. simple and readable. Um, so Bruno gave me that source code, and I'm going to get that up for everyone in the C++ track, that header file and all of his samples from last night. I'll get those replays. We did them live, so I, I captured them all. I'll get those replays up for everybody because they're, like this session, they're dense and important and cool, right? At least for me as an <laughs> old tools guy and programmer, but really cool. Uh, but thank everybody. Thank you, JT. Thank You're you, welcome. Lee. Thank you, Don. Is the, oh, there's a C plus. Go ahead, Lee. No, You're just saying bye. Oh yeah, bye. I think Don. There's C plus plus ISO C plus plus. Is it next week? Next week. Oh, it's Urbana Champlain. So it's in Illinois. Right. Okay, because Bjarne mentioned he was heading off to, he didn't say where, and I lost track of the meeting notes, but, so it's at, it's at University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign? Correct. Okay, well, you'll have to give us all a report uh, back from the meeting next week. That'll be cool. Okay. Uh, One other thing, David, there's yeah. also lots of other really cool C++ conferences, depending on where you are in the world. CPP uh, Con that I went to about a month ago in Seattle was a really impressive and really well uh, attended. Some great talks you saw. Bjarne is uh, make simple things simple, uh, simple task, simple talk. Um, the other one that's a big one is in uh, Aspen in the U.S. here. And then uh, take a look at cppiso.org because there's events in Europe that are really worth going to as well. I've been to a few of those as well. And just lots of great C++ uh, out there and uh, great community. So go check those out.